Okay. Um, Professor Galvano is um, traveling this morning, and so uh, previously we, uh, he had scheduled uh, the presentation that you're going to see about uh, printed circuit board uh, design and construction. So Mahesh is uh, passing these things around. Make sure that you get one of them. Uh, it's yours to keep. Um, um, we've got the privilege to have um, Mike Troy from Innovation Controls in San Antonio. Uh, what he does is what you will be doing with designing printed circuit boards. So he's got a presentation for you. Uh, David Bunton is uh, Vice President of Engineering for uh, Innovation Controls. Uh, he's here also. So you guys may want to uh, talk to both of these people after the class. Um, Mike, turn it over to you. Okay, thanks. <clears throat> so I'm Mike. Uh, if you can't hear me in the back, just raise your hand and I'll try to elevate a little bit. Uh, I've been at uh, Innovation Controls for about nine years now. I've been the only designer there for most of those years. I'm now the lead designer uh, at that company. Uh, prior to that, I had my own printed circuit design service bureau. So this is just a few uh, biographical notes on myself. Uh, I had my own service bureau for about 15 years. I've been designing circuit boards since longer than I care to mention. Uh, well over a thousand designs though, so been at this uh, for quite some time. I want to talk just a few minutes about our company, uh, Innovation Controls, <clears throat> and give you a little introduction to us. If I can get our paging to work here. I'm clicking, David. I need to escape. There we go. Uh, so here's our <clears throat> locations of our company. We're based uh, both in Tulsa, Oklahoma, and in uh, San Antonio. We have engineering offices, as you can see, uh, around the country. Uh, excuse me, around the world, in uh, three different comp uh, continents, actually. We're not a name that's well known, but we're actually market leaders uh, in uh, in the states and in some cases in the world. Uh, provider of control systems for the natural gas market, uh, particularly. Uh, so we're we're uh, interested in energy efficiency, uh, focused on that market. Uh, here you can see uh, in in the red there, uh, in the top picture, uh, one of our control stations. Uh, this is uh, out in the oil, oil field, the gas field, uh, and those are controls to pull the gas up out of the ground and shoot it into the pipeline. Uh, so that's one of the areas where we're interested in uh, fuel systems and engine controls for heavy duty. Uh, equipment. You can see a bus here, uh, also some uh, some semis, uh, things of that nature, uh, construction equipment. And then another uh, big area of ours uh, of late, the provider of displays uh, for the recreational market, not only marine, uh, which you see here with the, uh, the fellow wakeboarding. Uh, here's a shot of the cockpit on a, uh, a, I believe it's a correct craft boat, perhaps master craft. We work with many of them. You can see a number of our displays uh, there in the uh, in the cockpit of the boat. Also, up in the frozen north where I'm from, snowmobiles and the controllers, uh, power distribution, displays. Uh, for that uh, area of recreational vehicles, ATVs, uh, here you see a Polaris Razor. We do Razors, Rangers, a variety of uh, systems for uh, Polaris. And you can see some of the things that we do in addition to controllers. Uh, this is an embedded systems class. And here you can see uh, embedded systems is what we feature. We probably do as many as 70 complete embedded systems each year. So uh, that is our specialty, really. And hopefully that will be of real interest to you. You can also see you know, some of the uh, particular aspects there uh, of the technologies we provide in our displays, stereo design, audio, uh, Bluetooth devices, GPS, uh, all kinds of uh, uh, features for our displays. So those are vehicle technology uh, systems. Here are some of the major OEMs that we work with. You can see some of them there, uh, Cat, uh, Caterpillar, Kubota, 
uh, Cummins, Mastercraft, uh, and others that you may recognize there. Our company uh, is very much uh, integrated in terms of a, a start to completion uh, pr production of the uh, systems that we create. Here you see some of the real, real uh, tools that we use uh, out on our production floor. Uh, at the bottom you see uh, our, our pick and place uh, component assembly for circuit board uh, uh, setup. Uh, and uh, <clears throat> we're going to be talking a little bit about that in our presentation today. Also, we're a, a company that uh, likes to have fun. We like what we do. We work hard. We play hard. Uh, we enjoy working there. Our team works well together. Uh, as a result of that, we're interested in, uh, in having that kind of culture at our company. We're also dedicated to supporting our community. It's an important uh, feature of what we do. Uh, and we're, we're very interested in our employees, uh, continuing their training, uh, their mentoring, uh, helping them grow uh, in their set of skills. So that's a, a bit of a shameless uh, presentation of our company. Now uh, we'll move along to uh, uh, what we're here to talk about today, uh, innovation controls. Now you may wonder uh, why it is that that's important to you as, as prospective double E's. Well, here's, here's, if you take anything away from this presentation, please take these two points. The first is what, what the basic design process is, and by that I mean the, the printed circuit design process and, and the schematic that leads into it. And we're going to look at it uh, as kind of a broad brush uh, view um, with some details uh, to highlight some particular points. So let's take away the, the, the basic process, what it is. And the second question is, why, why is that important to you as, as double E's? I mean, you're gonna, you're, your interest is in designing products and concepts. Uh, so why do you care about this process? So we're going to talk about that a little bit. This uh, is a very integral part of the process of getting your pro uh, product uh, to market. Uh, so you may design, just to make a blanket statement, you may design a perfect product and have it on schematic. But unless you get that onto a physical reality, onto the circuit board, that product may not be a good product or it may not even be functional. So this is a key aspect to your success uh, as an embedded engineer uh, and designing products. So we do want to just emphasize this. It's not, it's not the only important step in the process, but it is a, an important step. And, and the better you're acquainted with it, uh, the more successful you're going to be as, a, as an embedded engineer. Uh, Professor Valvano sent uh, this to us uh, as an example of uh, work that you're uh, doing here uh, in your class. <clears throat> this is uh, a, a, an embedded design. It's got a processor. A number of uh, through-hole components, uh, both passives, uh, switches, connectors, and so forth, uh, but a two-layer design, uh, that's very common, or was very common years ago in our industry. And besides, bef besides that, before I move on, I see this strange shape there in the upper, upper left. Um, as I, I'm a northern Bohemia Yankee, so I'm not as familiar with all things Texas. So there you have an interesting component on your board. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> however, I saw something on Saturday. What was a Red River or something or other? <laughs> so congratulations, you guys, for taking care of business uh, uh, out there on the, uh, on the football field. So. But this is a two-layer design, mostly with through-hole components. What you're going to find out, and I think you'll find it out, uh, uh, as uh, Professor Bard said, in this class later on, most of the work you're going to be doing is with a surface mount components. And perhaps you're familiar with that term and, and that technology. Uh, here your processor is a surface mount device. Uh, you'll be, you'll be, and you have some more of them up there in the upper right as well. Uh, almost exclusively these days we're working with surface mount uh, components. And not just surface mount components, but multi-layer design. Not just the two layers that you see here, but many layers. The board you have uh, in your hands uh, this is the stack up uh, for that board. So the board's not just a, a two-dimensional uh, product. It, it has three dimensions. It has many layers to it. In this case, six. And you can see over on the left-hand side, we've got the, uh, the six signal layers. As you look at that board, you're going to see uh, green epoxy ink uh, deposited top and bottom. What that is is solder resist, or commonly referred to as solder mask. 
And what that's going to do when that board gets into the assembly process and you're assembling your components to the board, that's going to resist that solder bath anywhere that that green, green ink is, is deposited there. And it's going to, end up going to cause only the soldering uh, where you need it to be on the pads for components. If you look at the top of the board, this is like your board. This board is a, a, a board that has components on only one side. And so on the top of the board, you're going to see a, a number of silk screen uh, indications uh, in, the, for the most part, reference designators uh, indicating what those components are uh, for ease of recognition in, in debug and, and, and so forth. Some other features of the, uh, the stack-up drawing. Uh, it tells you just under the, uh, the title there what the thickness of the board is going to be. If you look over to the right, what the copper weight is or the thickness of copper on each layer. And then further to the right from that, what the dielectric uh, um, thicknesses are between each layer. Now on the board that you have, those were not particularly important numbers. <clears throat> they could vary uh, simply to get the stack up that we're looking for and the, th the total thickness that we're looking for. As we get into the discussion here, we're going to come in across a number of features that require much more precise dimensions for uh, both those copper weights and for the core thicknesses between those layers uh, as we get in. We'll talk about why that's the case uh, as we move forward. Let's talk just for a moment about CAD tools. Back in the day, I actually taped artworks. Perhaps none of you even heard of that term. But we used to do our artworks on big sheets of mylar with red and blue colored rolls of tape. <coughs> And we'd photograph that and use those photographic images uh, as the, the basis for printing the printed circuit board. Everything now is CAD tools, and thank goodness for you guys. Uh, you're not doing that. Uh, so we have CAD tools that do the schematic, the schematic capture, the net list, then ports over to the, to the printed circuit board. Um, within the schematic capture software, you might have some simulation tools uh, to do timing and, and signal integrity analysis. Uh, some thermal analysis, both thermal analysis, both on, on the schematic side and on the printed circuit board side. Uh, so these are tools that are available either from your tool vendor or, or from a third party. And then on the printed circuit board side, the software package that actually you use to design the board. I, I think you're using PC Artist, is that true? Is that what you used from Advanced Circuits to design uh, your first boards here? Uh, <clears throat> there are a number of vendors, uh, major vendors in the market marketplace. We'll talk about those in a moment. But within the, the printed circuit design software package, you're going to find um, uh, uh, sub-packages that help you do uh, or generate files for ICT testing and circuit testing to verify uh, component placement and values, uh, 3D mechanical uh, interfaces. Uh, in our case at Innovation Controls, we use SolidWorks as a 3D mechanical package, and we can uh, both import and export files from SolidWorks uh, into our designs. Uh, and then third-party uh, software available to help with output generation, generation, generating the files that are going to be sent to the manufacturer, uh, both, to us, both to make the, the printed circuit board and to, uh, uh, to the assembler uh, for XY component data, things like that, to assemble components to the board. Some of the major providers of uh, printed circuit design uh, tools, both schematic and PCB design tools, uh, Cadence with their Allegro or ORCAD products. You may have heard of some of these names. Uh, Mentor Graphics with their Expedition uh, and PADS products. The, the, the provider that we have focused on is Altium at, uh, at Innovation <laughs> Controls. Uh, Zucan, and there are others, but these are the major, the major players in that market. But the only thing that I would strongly recommend to you, uh, given the opportunity to have a say in, in tool selection at the companies where you're going to work in the future, is get an integrated tool. Get a tool that does both schematic path capture and printed circuit design from the same company. Uh, these guys don't always play well together uh, out there in the sandbox. Uh, now, some of the third-party tools for analysis or for output generation, things like that, uh, those are tightly integrated and, and designed to be tightly integrated by those third parties, but not the, the two big guys. Schematic capture and printed circuit design, get one from the same company. Uh, that would be uh, our recommendation. So here's a schematic uh, 
that is, and forgive the technology, these are TAC and Q signals uh, that are being sent to a high-speed digital printer. So that's, the, that's the, uh, the design of this schematic here. The TAC and Q signals come in on the connector to your left, and they progress to the right through isolators to eliminate transients from those signals as they come in. Uh, through those isolators to uh, um, differential buffers, uh, differential line drivers, buffers and line drivers, and then out to an RJ45 connector on the right-hand side and out to the out to the printer. Notice a couple of other things, and you may f find it difficult to read, but there are some notes there in the upper left that uh, discuss uh, the um, you know, the current requirements of some of these devices. Uh, and in the lower right, uh, lower left, sorry, you're going to see a number of decoupling capacitors uh, that are being used for this design. Now, those might be placed right at the at the components that they decouple or that they they provide uh, power for. Or as he's done here, he's provided notes on those uh, on those uh, capacitors exactly where he wants them to place, be placed. Uh, one each, for instance, on each of the four isolators. One each on each of the four um, uh, line drivers, and so forth. I mentioned that uh, in a pitch for you guys to do schematics carefully, do them well. What you do here, your print and circuit designer is going to be looking at in great detail. It's going to give him an indication of what he wants to do uh, in terms of his placement, uh, in terms of giving you a design that's going to be uh, both functional and effective. And so a design that's coherent, well laid out, easy to read, easy to follow, very important and either with components placed specifically where you would like them to be in relation to other components. Uh, for instance, having those decoupling caps right at the, at the device that they decouple. Yes, Bill. Uh, Mike, you might want to explain what that decoupling cap does. Okay, yeah, sorry. <clears throat> A device, an electronic device, when it's switching, uh, l loses power instantaneously. Uh, for a very brief period of time and it's disconnected from the power source of the board. If you have a decoupling cap and you want to place that very carefully right at the, at, at the pin uh, of the device that is decoupling, the power source to that device, you want to have that capacitor there. And what it does is it provides the charge during that switching time for that device. And so it doesn't lose power. Uh, at that time. So it's called a decoupling cap. It's also going to provide a little bit of noise immunity. It, it, it's, a, it's a wonderful device to have as, as an auxiliary uh, feature to that, uh, to that electronic uh, chip. So, it, and it's important where it gets placed. We're going to talk about that through a series of boards as we look at uh, through the presentation today. So, anyway, for the schematics, very important that you do them neatly, logically, coherently, you're passing along information to your designer that's going to be very important for him in the designing of his board. And here's the board that came from that layout. Now at the top you see that input connector. It's fixed in location and, and very often the printed circuit designer is not going to have any option for these. This thing is going to go in some sort of an enclosure. It connects to other things. Some things are going to be specified in, in terms of their location and that connector was. Uh, similarly, at the bottom, the RJ45 connector that goes out to the printer, very sp specifically fixed in location. All these other components that you see on the board here, uh, that's what your designer is going to be placing for you. And here you can see the flow from that, uh, uh, from that connector at the top, the input connector. And by these rubber banded connections, you can see the flow down to the isolators, from there down to the differential line drivers, and from there down to the RJ45 connector and off the board. So you can see the, the coherence, the, uh, the logic of the flow. Because the flow on, on the board wants to represent the flow that you're looking for from your schematic. I'm going to take just a minute and show you what some of these tools can do. This is that same board actually in the tool uh, that, uh, that we were working with. Notice we can grab this component, move it around rotate it, that's going to help your designer know where he wants to put that component. Okay? <clears throat> and here are the decoupling caps that we talked about. Notice they're right at the power pins of these devices. So those are located where they want to be. Uh, and the progression 
and the rubber banded connection helps you and helps the PCB designer in placing these components uh, in a very logical flow. And, and so that's what you see here. Let me get back out of this and get back to our uh, presentation. Call that a rat's nest, by the way, as you can see there. And believe me, it gets much more work, much worse than this. Uh, and there's the finished board, where all those uh, rubber banded connections are now um, uh, translated into into etch on the board. So you can see the traces and the flow of that uh, uh, straight on through, just as we discussed a few moments ago. This is a four layer board. Uh, so the inner two layers, which you're not seeing here, there's one that's uh, entirely power, one that's entirely ground. Uh, that provides a number of, uh, of great things for you uh, to have those features available. The ground plate, for instance, gives you uh, ground everywhere on the board. Uh, every signal that you route has a, needs a return path right back to where it came from. And that ground plane gives you, uh, if the, for the most part, very good and accurate return paths. Uh, power plane gives you nice distribution uh, where you're not going to get any voltage drops, any uh, inductance problems, you're going to have that power uh, available wherever you need it for these devices. So that's what I've got on the inner layers here. What you're seeing here are the outer two layers. In this case, most of the routing is occurring on the top side, and you see it there in blue. <clears throat> there are some red traces from the input connector simply to escape uh, from that connector and get them out to where they can uh, migrate up to the top of the board. That feature, by the way, is called a VIA familiar with that? Perhaps you've been using them on boards that you've been doing? A VIA gets you from one side of the board to the other. Uh, typically, uh, for the most part, they're going to be completely through the board. There are VIAs available that only impact one side of the board and go down a layer or two. They're called blind VIAs. There's also buried VIAs. So I don't get too involved in this, but there are VIAs that are entirely buried between boards of many layers. A VIA that might go, for instance, from layer 3 to layer 10. Uh, but it never emerges uh, into the outer layers of the board. What we're going to be dealing with in our presentation here is simply through whole vias, all the way through the board. Uh, so here we've got uh, uh, vias that take our connections uh, from, <clears throat> from layer 4 to layer 1, and then layer 1 throughout uh, until we get down and getting these connections out to the RJ45 connector, and they're going to go back uh, to layer 4. Yes? Wouldn't the via connect to the ground if it's going through it? Actually, uh, that's a good question. <clears throat> Those features can be set up with anti-pads as you set up a, a, a pad stack, not only for components here, but for the vias themselves. And where the, and the intelligence in the system will tell you where it needs to be connected. If it's a, if it's a ground connection that you're connecting it to, that via will take that connection <coughs> and it'll reject every other connection as far as a, uh, as a design rule, a connectivity rule. And so what you're going to see, and we'll see, we'll see some of these, uh, we can look at them uh, in, in pictures uh, as, that are coming up, uh, you'll have clearance in that plane around that via where it's not supposed to be connected. Okay? That's <clears throat> Moving on to the next one. This is, uh, you can see that's the board that you have in your hands. Um, <clears throat> In this case, what we've got are, are all the components, or, or the great majority of the components, and again, we're talking about placement now, uh, are off in the queue. Uh, they're at the bottom of the uh, bottom of the board. They need to be placed. Uh, what you see, and I've left these components on that are on the board specifically there because those are all the ones that are fixed in place. You can see the connector in the lower right. Uh, straight up above that, that's a pressure sensor. And you can see the fingers that are on the board, and there's the location of the pressure sensor as it's assembled to the board. Above that, and to working our way around uh, clock, uh, counterclockwise, there's a, a test header at the top. In the upper uh, left is a thermistor. So these are sensors, both the pressure sensor, the thermistor. And then coming back down on the left-hand side, you see six Hall Effect positional sensors uh, there. And all those are very tightly fixed uh, dimensionally to the board. And then down at the bottom, you've got three large components. If you take your board and turn it over and look at the back, and you see that uh, shape where the, the solder mask has been evacuated. And so you see the solder uh, at that location. That's designed as a heat relief uh, uh, technique for these three devices. These are all generate a lot of heat in their work. The one on the, on the right of those three is a voltage regulator. 
Uh, the other two are um, H bridges, and they generate a lot of heat during the operation of this thing. So what we've got, and you'll and you'll see on your board, there's foil all around that thing on the top side of the board. You see foil ex excessive around that. That's to get some heat away from that component. And then there's vias all around each of those components. And what those vias do is take that heat from that top layer all the way down, and we get that heat out on the bottom into the case, the uh, metal case of this particular product through that open area. So it's just a technique that we've used, but that means that those components are now fixed in place. So, As far as placement from here, what you're going to what you're going to be particularly concerned about are, are uh, as you start your placement, and now we're talking about uh, a procedure for placement. Really, you, you, you look at your board and all your components. Where do I start? Where do I, where do I put these components? Well, these things are fixed in place. So there are other components that you're going to build off of these things that need to be near those components that are already there. So the six pin connector you see in the lower right, there are components that have to be very near to that. We're going to look at those in a moment. Um, components that need to be near these other features. We'll look at those in a moment as well. And by the way, just to put in a pitch for placement, is probably the most key aspect of this process. If you've got a placement that's successful and, and accomplishes all your purposes, the routing is just going to flow naturally. If you don't, that routing is going to be contorted and you're going to get noisy signals, <coughs> problems that you're going to have to deal with. So I want to emphasize that take your time with the placement of the, of the product. Uh, that's a key feature of this design process. So let's uh, let's just page down again, and you know we're talking about uh, components that need to be placed near the connector. Uh, and notice I've got a little a little bit of the schematic uh, uh, shown here. There's your connector on the on the left. On the right, notice the components. These are components that are designed to uh, filter out transients for this power. Most of the power that we use in our, ours is the automotive or engine world. Uh, most of our power source is battery. Uh, it can be pretty dirty at times. And we, we, and we're going to have transients and so you see the diodes and the capacitor share. That's their function is to take those transients out before they get onto the board uh, and destroy our electronics. So you can see the note that our guy has put on here and, and we're, we're talking about, and again, getting back to the schematic and information you need to translate to your uh, printed circuit designer. These need to be close to the connector or else they're not going to do their, 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 perform their function effectively. And so here you can see, if you look at the, uh, at the snapshot of the board below, uh, those uh, components, C7, D1, C6, C9, and D2, are all closely coupled to that connector. And you can see the heavy signals that are there because we're talking about some significant current here, some number of amps perhaps. And so those need to be tight as you see here. Similarly, looking at another part of the schematic, but we'll look at the same board image, here we've got CAN, uh, CAN signals coming in that, that are coming in from the connector. CAN plus and minus as a pair and a CAN terminator uh, signal. Uh, these are signals coming onto the board from the connector as well. Uh, CAN is a uh, is a um, a communication protocol that's I think it's unique to the automotive world. I don't know that it's used anywhere else. Um, uh, you use USB and Ethernet and other uh, communications protocols in other areas. CAN is is specific uh, for the automotive world, and that's what these signals are for. But notice, I've got another note here. Keep these these components D5, C42, 43. You've got some resistors there as well that need to be close to the, com to the connector. So we've got some indication where those need to go. And you can see them, the pair of signals, again we've got a plus and minus, being routed together, and we'll talk about that a little bit more as well, uh, through the, uh, the diode clamp and then through the components down to U8, down at the bottom there, uh, which is the CAN transceiver, sending those signals, receiving those signals out uh, from the board. We've got another note in our schematic over to the left. You see it says route parallel. That's the plus and minus signal pair. Those signals are routed together. Uh, not so much for impedance reasons, but for common mode rejection of noise. So that we get clean communication signals there. So we've started our placement by putting things where, where we know they need to go uh, to start with by the connector. Similar, similarly speaking, and now if we just go back a little bit, 
After we've got things like that placed, things near the connector, things near these high heat generating devices, things will, uh, components will need to go near the Hall effect sensors. So those are understood. We've got components left after we've done that. The first one you're going to want to place is the one that has the highest connectivity to it. And that, of course, just like it was on your board, is that processor you want. It, you're, you're going to want to get that guy on there. He's going to be kind of the focus of a lot of the other electronics on the board. If you look at this board, there's only one place to put it. You can, and you can play with that all you want. You're going to find one place, and it's just to the left of U5, that big sensor. That's the only place it's going to fit. So your choices are limited there. Once you've got that, once, but, but the way it's rotated is something that you need to be concerned about and how it's going to connect and interface to other components. Going back down to this schematic, uh, here we've got just a little bit of the processor in the schematic on the uh, upper left there. Uh, and then components, we talked about the coupling caps. C12 and C13 are on very specific pins of that processor to make sure we have a clean power source, uh, clean and steady power source to those components. Uh, also, we've got this oscillator circuit. I think you've already talked about the importance of crystals and their placement with respect to the components that they generate clocks for. Very critical. They want to be nice and tight. They want to be via, uh, connections with no vias on them to, to add inductance to them. That You don't want to have other signals running around them, especially noisy signals that are going to in interfere with them. That's a very important part of the circuit. So once you've got that processor placed, then that tells you where other things need to go. And again, we're still in the placement process, getting those components into the right location on the board. So far, our decoupling, which needs to be by those pins, you're going to see C12 and C13, uh, some other components over there as well, that are nice and tight up against the pins that they support on the board. And the crystal circuit, nice and tight to the two pins where, uh, where it provides the clock uh, for your processor. So again, you're proceeding through your placement of that board. So far, we've been talking about just our, our six-layer board and, and a relatively few number of components. A board that has components on only one side. Uh, that was true of your board. It's, tr it's true of all the boards we've looked at so far. Here's different. Uh, this is one of the display boards. In fact, you saw the, the Razor in our earlier marketing presentation, the, the Polaris Razor, the ATV. This is the uh, display board for that razor. And there's a lot of things going on there. I'm just going to slip down and just read the list of things, the list of features that we've got on that board, just to give you an idea of what's there. Uh, at the bottom, in the middle, you see the processor, 400 pins. Just below that, you've got two DDR memories for storage. Off to the right, you've got an EMMC memory, flash, non-volatile. Uh, memory. Uh, straight over to the left on the far left hand side, you see U29 there? That's a Bluetooth module. So we've got Bluetooth support on this board. Um, across the top, both on the top left and the top right, are our power supply circuits coming in off the connector. The big connector um, above and to the right of the, of the Bluetooth module called J2. That's a USB interface to the board. It's, it's a sealed USB connector going out the back of the case. Um, and then directly below, uh, between the Bluetooth and the processor, is a video circuit. So in this board, we've got two video line-ins. We've got line-in and out audio for the Bluetooth uh, support. We've got USB. We've got DDR, embedded flash. We've got all kinds of things going on on this board. Way more than you're going to be able to put on one side obviously. And so you can see in, in red and blue here components on both sides of the board. Heavily populated uh, on the board. <clears throat> this board, by the way, uh, turned out to be 12 layers. And we're going to talk about that a little bit more uh, as we go. There's a, uh, a close-up of the processor uh, for this board. Now this is a, a, a BGA processor, if you're familiar with that term. It's a device that has balls for its connections on only the bottom side of the part. And those balls solder to the board, uh, to this footprint image that you see here. Uh, you won't be able to access them once that part is soldered to the board, by the way, to make any changes. Uh, design becomes pretty critical uh, for a part like this. A couple of things to think about as we look at the processor. 
you see all those red uh, components underneath the part on the other side of the board? Those are decoupling caps. For the processor, probably as much as any other part on the board, decoupling is critical. Uh, and the core voltages, which you're going to find on the center pins of that, of that processor, right in the middle, uh, need to have support. It's a very low voltage. It's perhaps 1 volt, 1.0 volts, 1.2 volts, could be 1.8, something like that. And it needs to have capacitor support. So here we've got them placed right underneath the part, uh, right at the pins that they're going to support. They're all going, also going to be um, the components around the perimeter for perimeter uh, power and ground supplies. You'll also notice as you look at this, now blue is the top side, red is the bottom. And we can only escape from these balls directly with traces on the top side of the board in very few locations as you look around the perimeter of the part. There's only a few of them that we can do. And that's a lot of pins. All those pins have signals, they all need to go somewhere. And so you're going to see in each case where that pin is used, there is a small connection to a, to a, me, a, a via immediately. There's a via instantiated between, almost between each set of four pins on the ball. So that those connections, especially from the inside of the part, well into the part, can escape. So that's essentially a, a, a skate path, a fan out, if you will, of those pins so you can get your connections out from underneath that part. By the way, 400 pins is nowhere near as many as you're going to see <laughs> as time goes on. Uh, I've done as many as 2,000 uh, pins on the part. So it gets, it gets pretty, uh, pretty intense. But at this point, when you're looking at this part, you can begin to determine and verify what your stack up is. Why is it you need 12 layers? Well, here's why. You're going to need to get those lines out from the inside of this. This is an explosion of connections right at this location on the board. Those connections need to get out from underneath that part. And so you need routing layers to do that. There's a couple hundred connections that need to escape. Uh, so you've not only got more routing layers, but you've also got need to have more plane layers to support the various voltages that are required on the board. In this case, we've got six voltage uh, ground and power layers and six routing layers uh, to accomplish the routing that we need to do. We're going to look at some uh, special uh, examples of, of routing here in a minute uh, that show you some of the, the features of some of the, the very uh, signal integrity specific things that we need to do. But before we do that, let's just look at this one layer pair. This is an adjacent layer pair internal to the board. I think this is layers six and seven, so right in the middle. And what I wanted to emphasize uh, on this particular slide is you want to, on layer pairs in the board, and you want to have signal layers together and then a, a pair of ground power layers next to them if you can for shielding and for impedance control and various other reasons. But notice on these two layers, while it's not a perfect match, we've got one layer that's essentially going north and south, and the other that's essentially going east and west. You want to try to do that as best you can. It, it, it's going to fall apart as you design your circuit, uh, and you're going to get some overlap, and some things are going to be going different directions. But as a general rule, try to get those adjacent routing layers perpendicular to each other. What's that going to do for you? First of all, it's going to allow you routing channels, because if they're both going the same way, you're blocking yourself off. No longer can you route through there. So you've got to have layers on the board where you can travel east and west and travel north and south. And you've got to allow yourself those channels for routing, or you're never going to get it done with all those signals that you have to contend with. The other thing is crosstalk. If you've got signals on adjacent layers that are running right on, right on top of each other for an extended period of time, those signals are going to start to interfere with each other. It's called crosstalk. And so if you can get them running perpendicular, that now you're limiting that crosstalk to something that's not, not a problem. Uh, so just another reason why you want to have layer pairs, and again, this is a very kind of a core routing principle to have them routed uh, in opposing directions. Let's look at some special cases. <clears throat> You talked a little bit earlier about the, the power supply. Uh, your power supply is going to typically come in on a connector somewhere on your board that's fixed in location, generally speaking. You want to do something with that power before it gets all over the board. You want to deal with it right away. It's, it may have transients, as in our case, with our battery supply. You're going to want to regulate that to get different voltages, voltages for use on your board. 
uh, do it right at the location if you possibly can where it comes on the board. And that's what we've done here. We've got the connector on your left slide there, the connector in the lower uh, right. Power is coming onto the board. We're immediately going through uh, inductors, capacitors, diodes, things to clean that power up. What you're looking at uh, in the upper part of that slide is a switching power supply. Uh, the power supply is actually fairly small in the middle left. It's, uh, it has its label U4, if you can see that there. That's the power supply itself. All these other large components, the inductors around there, the capacitors, the diodes, are all in support of that switching power supply. As that supply does its, uh, does its work, it generates some fairly large spikes. And, and so a lot of these, uh, the location of these components are designed to minimize those spikes and its effect on the rest of the board. So all those ground connections for all those components around that device are geared to come back to the, the, the core of that device and be grounded right there so that, so that it's localized, the, the, the problem is localized as it should be. This design is not something you need to come up with yourself. For this case and in many cases, the manufacturer of these parts is going to give you some very specific direction uh, on where you want to place those components and how you want to route them. So both placement and routing, uh, you don't particularly need to be concerned about that. Just follow the, the guidance that's given uh, from the manufacturer. On the right, we've got some routing uh, in our DDR memory. If you've been exposed to DDR uh, from a printed circuit design point of view, it's, it, it's, it's pretty intense. You want to keep, as, as you saw in our design, the, the, the memory itself very close to the processor. In, in our case, to each of the DDR memory devices, we've got a set of uh, 16 uh, data bits. We've got uh, strobes and masks and, and clocks for each of those. We've got 16 address bits, and we've got a whole bunch of controls. The, the data bits from the processor to the DDR have all got to be the same length. And they've all got to be a very specific width in order to be impedance controlled. And there it gets back to our stack up, what the difference is between layers, what the copper weight is on each layer. All of those factors come into the equation to give you impedance control. Let's say you're trying to match uh, for single ended or uh, single line impedance 50 ohms, or for uh, a differential pair, 100 ohms. Uh, and all those equations you can. Put these, put these uh, dimensions into there and get the, the proper width for your traces, the proper separation from the planes, uh, all of those kinds of things. Each of these signals needs to have a reference plane immediately next to it. Either a ground or power plane uh, would serve that purpose. And here you can see all these uh, looped connections here on those lines. Well, why is that? Well, those are data bits and they all need to be matched in length from the processor to the memory within 25 thousandths of an inch. So it's very tight, uh, and, and so some of those signals are going to run their entire length straight because they're the longest ones. Some are going to be looping back upon themselves simply to get uh, the line length involved so that all those bits arrive at the DDR memory at the right time and be, can be uh, recognized as such. Uh, can you please repeat this point once again? Sorry? Can you please repeat uh, this point once again, the length travel by, say, the data bits? Yeah, the data bits to the DDR memory all have to arrive at the device uh, within a very limited amount of time. So they have to be equalized in length so that they can get there all within that same amount of time. So if you've got uh, eight data bits on one side, eight more on the other, they've also got strobes and masks to go with them. To uh, They go as a set. All of those lines from the processor to the memory need to have the same length so they get there at the same time. Routing those, the challenge for the PCB designer is that as they come from the processor and go to the DDR, they're not all going to be the same length. So you've got to, as a designer, either add length or, well, you've got to find out what the longest one is, make it as short as you can, and then add length to the others so that they all have the same length. Within 25 thousandths of an inch, I mean, that's really, really small. So. The address, not quite so uh, critical, maybe within a tenth of an inch of each other. The control, similarly. Uh, but those data bits and the clock and other things, very, very tightly controlled. Yes? Uh, don't those slopes create problems with picking up EMF noise? Uh, 
uh, EMF. Do they behave like because on Tana sort of looks like the same thing? Be because of the, yeah. the the structure of them, uh, probably not. You're going to have that. That's, those are going to be embedded layers for the most part. They're going to be between ground planes. Very short. They're very short. Uh, the entire the entire length of, of any of these lines that you see here is less than an inch and a half. So they're not, yeah, that, well, that won't be a problem in this case. Uh, I understand your question though, and that, that certainly can be a problem, the, the electromagnetic magnetic effects of signals that they can do. We're getting close to the end of our time. I want to look at these, uh, at these last two slides as well that we got here. And here, uh, uh, both of these slides are on their side, but uh, there on the top you can see the Bluetooth module over to the right. And notice the shielding that we had to do from the Bluetooth module itself to the capacitors immediately uh, adjacent to it as part of the filtering for those line in and out signals. Very sensitive audio signals. Uh, and not only the, the capacitors there and the shielding around it, but the differential pairs of signals two signals, a plus and minus, that run together. And you can see them there in the brown up to the, the red section, which are components on the back of the board. Um, uh, so you're, you're running through that device and then generating another set of differential signals and out to the connector. So some very, very specific routing. There are dimensions of those, uh, of the line widths of those differential pair signals and the distance between those, uh, those lines in the pair, very critical. Uh, and of course, both audio and video very, very susceptible to a few dB of noise, uh, and that's all going to affect the quality of your signal, both audio and video. At the bottom, we're looking at those two video line inputs, and again, you can see the shielding that's that's been done there. Uh, it's immediately above a ground plane, and we've introduced a ground plane immediately below it. So essentially, we're trying to create a coax connection on the circuit board uh, to really keep those signals nice and clean. So that's a very brief presentation. Uh, after you've got your circuit board done, there's a lot to say about circuit board manufacturing, a lot to say about post-processing of the design. Uh, you've got to do, uh, DRC is design rule checking. You set up rules to, to cover all these aspects of board design that you've been doing as you complete that board. You've got to look very carefully at those design rules, run your checks. Uh, and make sure that you're not violating any of those for clearances and having shorts on the board, things like that. Make sure all your connections are there. And then the outputs, uh, things that you're going to actually send to the manufacturer or send to the assembler uh, in order for them to make your board. Uh, of particular note, the Gerber files, or more importantly, the ODB++ output file. It's a data-rich output file that, that converts CAD data to CAM data. And the CAM data is what they're looking for at the manufacturer, computer-aided manufacturing data. Uh, and so that's one file for all the layers of your board, and that's what we use to send to our manufacturer. Various documentation uh, features, fab and assembly drawings, uh, and then XY component data. So your pick-and-place assembler can properly pick up those components, put them in the right place on the board. So I don't know if we have any time for questions and answers, but uh, we'll be... We'll be staying around for a little while if you have a few minutes and have anything that you would like to ask. Uh, we'd certainly be happy to talk to you. So it's 10 2, Bill. Are we done? Yep. Wonderful. <laughs> okay.